Welcome to Zero Knowledge, a podcast where we explore the latest in blockchain technology and the decentralized web. The show is hosted by me, Anna. And me, Frederick. Today we sit down with Daniel from Grin to talk about Mimblewimble and the Grin implementation of that protocol. Before we start, we want to say thank you to this week's sponsor, Aragon One. If you're excited about working on the front lines of crypto adoption and have customer support experience, then you should check out the head of support role at Aragon One. This will be an important role educating Aragon users and helping them succeed at using the platform to create and manage their crypto native organizations. You can find information about the head of support role and other roles Aragon One is hiring for at aragon.one slash jobs. That's A-R-A-G-O-N dot O-N-E slash jobs. So thank you again, Aragon One. And now here's our episode with Daniel from Grin. Today we're sitting down with Daniel and Anna, as usual. Uh, Daniel comes from uh, Grin and sort of we'll talk about the Mimble Wimble protocol a little bit, uh, Grin, and sort of how things have evolved. Welcome to the show. Th thanks for having me. It's great to be on the show. So who are you? What's your background? Uh, how did you get into working on Mimble Wimble? Uh, I'm um, half Swedish, half Greek, live in London, and have been working in um, online gaming for the past 12 years, having business development, was doing a bit of marketing. And then for the past eight years, I was doing product management and concept development. And um, I got into Grin after finding out about it at ECC in Paris uh, in 2018. Uh, and it was very interesting uh, during the conference, as, as I was kind of watching, hearing other speakers, I was starting to dig in more and more into this this idea of Mimble Wimble, there were, there were some slides up from Stanford or something. And, and the, the more I was reading about it, I was like, oh, okay, this is super interesting technology. And then I started looking into this Grin project uh, that was implementing it. And I kind of got sucked into it because more, more from being intrigued by the fact that there were these uh, developers that were coming together, implementing the protocol in, in the way that they were doing it without any specific structure or any direct gains from it. It just felt crazy, especially at the time of like early 2018, uh, that people were doing this without uh, ICOs or, or schemes to, to self-finance themselves, uh, which intrigued me. And I just wanted to find out more and more about this. And then I got involved uh, and have been contributing around the governance, uh, admin, product management side of things. I guess when you would have discovered that, it must have just sounded so refreshing. Yeah, absolutely. It was like a breath of fresh air. Uh, and, and there was also like this, so Grin itself aims to be very lightweight. It's one of the kind of core ethos. And they were taking the, the kind of minimal approach to, to designing a protocol and, and a system. And it was very intriguing and refreshing to see that at the time where it felt like almost everybody was trying to solve problems in a very complicated way and just adding complexity, layers and layers of complexity on top of everything. Um, that, that fascinated me. Had you already been working with blockchain networks and protocols before that? Because you were at ECC, so I guess you were curious at least. Yeah, so, so I've been um, following the space since uh, 20... I bought my first Bitcoin in 2013. I, uh, for work, was exploring various approaches, kind of were, were kind of keeping the ear to the ground in, in terms of uh, what was happening in the developments of some of the, the approaches. And uh, we... I was doing some proof of concepts with regards to Bitcoin integration and payment processing. And as part of that, it was kind of interesting also because it became, um, as part of my work, I was realizing that in order for a business to transact in Bitcoin and accept Bitcoin payments from users, there are stringent regulatory requirements. And there kind of seemed like the, the writing was on the wall that it's just going to become harder and harder to transact in Bitcoin on scale for regulated entities. Uh, because you, you needed not only to know your customer, 
but you also needed to know know their coin, right? Their, their, their coin whereabouts. They need to run uh, checks on the coins themselves and re- refund uh, you know coins that are not um, deemed worthy enough for to, to 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 be accepted. And that kind of just struck me as something that would would lead to th- there being different types of of Bitcoin uh, worth different uh, having different value. Uh, because a, a Bitcoin with a kind of clear or clean transaction history, it's going to be easy, e- easier to transact with than, than one that doesn't. And, and that, you know, made me realize how important fungibility is, which uh, feels like Green is trying to address to some extent. So you say you just sort of found this project, started contributing, you explained a little bit of what you do, but what is your role at Grin? And, and what is Grin? Is it a company? And like, how do you get involved? Are you just an open source contributor? How does this this work? Sure, it's a, that's a great question. Uh, I'm um, I'm part of the core team of, of Green, uh, which is uh, it has evolved as part of the Green, Green governance. Green is an open source community. Uh, it, it's run as any open source community project. There's no company. There's no foundation. There's no legal entity around it, uh, and it's uh, founded by uh, anonymous individuals. And some some people contributing are anonymous. Others are not. I clearly am not. And um, as part of the evolution of governance, which I'm sure we can get into in more detail later, a, a core team was established, which was like a technocratic council originally based on some contributors that were contributing frequently. And that has kind of evolved into its own governance structure now. Is Grin a company now? No, there's no entity. There's no legal entity. There's no foundation. The, there's nothing like that. The, the entire um, project is community funded, 100% by donations. So there's no... ICO, there's no pre-mine, there's no developer tax, uh, there are no investors, there's no CEO, uh, nothing like that. Real decentralized. Well, to, to, as much as we can. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So I remember the first time I heard about Mimblewimble, I think it was from kind of a technical analyst at a fund who had like discovered it through his research. And it was presented as very much like a mysterious new protocol that was like, the author is unknown. It was sort of dropped somewhere on a forum. I don't actually know this origin story, but I'm sure you do. So what is that origin story of Mimblewimble? Where does it come from? Sure. It, it involves a lot of magic and, and uh, wizardry. Uh, <laughs> yeah. So so in, uh, I think, summer 2016, uh, an anonymous individual joined the Bitcoin Wizards IRC channel and uh, dropped uh, an onion link on the Tor, uh, linking to the Tor network of a paper that was just a text file uh, hosted there and then disappeared. That text file outlined um, a protocol which the author Tom Elvis Jedusor, which is the French name for Lord Voldemort from the Harry Potter series, was outlining a, a protocol uh, named after a tongue-tying curse in, uh, in the Harry Potter books. I haven't read the books myself, but that's what I'm told at least. Uh, so this uh, this contribution from this anonymous author bring together concepts that had been uh, proposed before, uh, notably confidential transactions, coin join, that were proposed by Gregory Maxwell, and uh, one-way aggregated signatures, which was from an anonymous contributor, and, and, and putting it all together in, a, in an elegant way uh, for a blockchain design, which hadn't been done before. And uh, this was later then uh, improved by Andrew Polstra, uh, and formalized into a paper. I think the original author had made some mistakes uh, that then was corrected. And a few months later after that, I think in around October 2016, another anonymous individual um, or pseudonymous individual uh, showed up to the scene and called themselves Ignotus Peverell, which is also a Harry Potter character, uh, and uh, said that they had started a Rust implementation of the Mimblewimble protocol called Grin after Grin got wizardy bank. <laughs> so I think that's kind of where the, the Harry Potter references end. And the, from there on, um, this anonymous uh, individual uh, started working on the project and a community was formed around it uh, that has evolved into what it is today. Uh, we launched in uh, January 15, 2019, after I think four different test nets. So it was about two and a half years of development. And I, got, I joined the project in um, March, April 2018, I think. So you mentioned Grin, Grin, the project that sort of formed, it sounds like very organically, but there's another implementation of Mimblewimble, correct? It's Beam. That's right. 
obviously the focus of this podcast is going to be on Grin and your work with Mimble Wimble, but maybe it's, I'm just curious, like, are they implementing the same thing? Do you guys work together? Is that a group? Like, they're a company. Yes. So, um, so yeah. Grin is the first project that aimed to implement Mimble Wimble uh, and is written in Rust. At about, I think, shortly after the time I joined, actually, in 2018, uh, another project was announced, Beam, which is a second, a different implementation of the Mimblewimble protocol written in C++ by a, a for-profit company with investors that has a um, funding structure through their coin that, that, you know, as a founder's reward, similar to how Zcash is set up. But the projects are separate completely. Uh, they have a different implementation. It, it builds on some of the work that had been done already with Grin, you know, some of the challenges. And there was a ma- mailing list, a Mimblewimble mailing list, that um, was very close to the Green Project that was discussing a lot of different approaches of how to solve some of the challenges of implementing Mimblewimble, uh, which obviously uh, Beam also could enjoy, uh, take a similar approach to some of many of the problems. But they also have a different way of handling some other things. And we communicate uh, openly on forums and so on if we have technical questions and so on. But the projects are run separately, completely. Okay. So Mimblewimble is sort of the protocol, this thing that was dropped anonymously, papers have been written, and then Grin started working just organically on an implementation of that. Beam came later. But to be clear, like they're not aiming to implement the protocol in exactly the same way. It's not wire compatible or anything. No, it's not compatible. I think there, I think there are subtle differences in some of the ways that things are done. I don't know the full details of it. Um, but it, it's, it, it is its own implementation. It's not a fork or anything like that. Yeah. So let's dig in and try to explore what Mimblewimble is as a protocol. So what are the basics? What's, what's the point of this protocol, first of all? Sure. So um, the protocol aims to be privacy-preserving and scalable comparing to some of the alternatives out there. In Mimblewimble, there is no... Not only is the project itself minimal, but the protocol itself is, is quite minimal uh, in the sense that it tries to keep as little information as possible on chain. Uh, there is no uh, amounts. Uh, there is no addresses. In fact, there's very little data on chain. It's just a chain of inputs spending to a, to a chain of outputs and something called kernels. So if there's no addresses, then how do you actually transact and send money back and forth? Well, in Mimblewimble, this is interactive. Uh, the sender and receiver needs to interact in a round trip to build a transaction. So, so each output in, in Mimblewimble has its own private key. So when you start a transaction, a sender designates which outputs uh, to, to spend uh, and some other details and sends that to the receiver using whichever communication channel is available to them. Uh, the receiver specifies which new output to spend to, which only they control, and signs the message and returns it to the sender. The sender then kind of finalizes that transaction, signs it, and can broadcast it to the node. So this interactivity is, is, is unique and kind of key to, to understanding how member women transactions work. And as, as a result, part of the like, properties of the, of the protocol itself allows only block headers, the list of the unspent transaction outputs, and transaction kernels, uh, which are uh, small... Um, 100 byte proofs that uh, the transaction sum correctly, i.e. that the inputs uh, equals the, the outputs, and also that the parties have knowledge of the private keys involved. So only the block headers, the UTXOs, and the transaction kernels are required in order to do a full sync and achieve the same security properties as a full node in Bitcoin. That was actually a question that I had is, is it very, very similar to Bitcoin or is it drawing from a few different protocols? I'm kind of trying to position it. I think what I always been curious about is like what makes it dramatically new? I understand this sort of back and forth and this like interactive nature, but is it living in a completely different category or is it very, very close to one of the known protocols? So it kind of builds on the learnings that uh, the insights kind of discovered and pioneered by Bitcoin and other protocols and achieves something that has the same security properties in a simpler way uh, with less data kept on chain. So with uh, a protocol like Bitcoin, the security is derived uh, and kind of scales with the number of transactions on the chain. You keep that history on chain in perpetuity. 
Uh, Grin scales with the number of UTXOs and the, the kernels, but that's a small amount compared to the UTXO size. So you, you need less data on chain and you get the same properties. Is there any similarity to something like Zcash or these or Monero, the other privacy related or privacy focused blockchains? So I think one of the, the one thing that's worth adding about Mimblewimble as well is that the assumptions made, the cryptographic assumptions made in order to achieve this protocol are minimal. The the only assumption is that the discrete logarithm problem is hard to solve, which is a battle tested assumption in, in cryptography that has been around for decades. Other protocols make different security assumptions and have different trade-offs to achieve their level of privacy. Uh, stuff, uh, things like ZK Snarks have a trusted setup and are much more, uh, have much different storage uh, and processing requirements. And um, Monero uh, have a, a different uh, way of, uh, of achieving their level of privacy and, and they do so with uh, more overhead. But similarly, I, I should say that you know, Grin, the, the way Grin works and the way um, you achieve some of the privacy preserving abilities is that a transaction consists of um, a set of inputs spends to a set of outputs and a transaction kernel. Similarly, a block uh, contains a set of inputs spends to a set of outputs and a transaction kernel. And in fact, the entire chain is a set of inputs spending to a set of outputs and transaction kernels. And it kind of is just the similar structure. It's, this kind of unified structure allows uh, all outputs to hide amongst each other uh, in, in a kind of very elegant way. And you can achieve uh, something called cut-through, uh, where, um, say, if, um, if I spend to Frederick, uh, if I send the 10 grins to Frederick, and Frederick sends 10 grins to Anna, we can do cut-through and remove Frederick from the equation and only keep the fact that I spent spend 10 grins and they can go straight to Anna. We don't need to keep all the data on chain. Uh-huh. So how does that work? Is it like after every transaction or after every like leap, something is wiped out or? The transactions can aggregate and they can aggregate. It's easy to aggregate them into a block, which can then be aggregated into a full chain. And each node only keeps the data uh, that they need to keep in order to maintain a full sync. Obviously, nodes can keep more data if they want, but you only need less data need a, le- a small amount of data to do a full sync, basically. Oh, wow. So it would basically be up to the miners to say this middle transaction is unnecessary. We can remove it here and keep the same properties of, of like the total amounts spent and, and sort of the same end result. So if I understand correctly, a block is the normal header information that you would have in any blockchain, more or less. And then you have your set of inputs that are acted on, your set of outputs, and these transaction kernels. And that's the entire block. Correct. And then the entire blockchain is basically just the sum of all of these inputs and outputs over time. So you're, you're so when you're syncing, you're just kind of playing through these inputs and outputs, and, and you end up with like a, a final set. That is the state of the chain. Correct. And that's the block headers, the UTXO set, and the kernel set. And it's interesting. So today, uh, Green utilizes Schnorr signatures. If we would uh, end up using BLS signatures instead, that would allow us to aggregate kernels as well. Uh, Unfortunately, that would also come with different security assumptions. uh, But it's something that we're interested in exploring further and understanding a bit more what that would mean. That would basically allow us to uh, compress the kernel set as well. So that explains where some of the scalability properties come from and how you can keep the chain small. But I'm still not entirely sure where the privacy comes from. So one part of it is obviously that you can't see which address sends to which address. And you get that by having this online requirement. But you also mentioned that you can hide some of your outputs in the in the total sets. What do you mean by that? So, so uh, first of all, there's no online requirement. So you can build a transaction offline if you want. Uh, I can send you a file uh, over email, USB stick, or we can uh, use a carrier pigeon, uh, and uh, we can transact and like build this transaction together interactively. Uh, and then one of us needs to broadcast it to the chain at that point. Okay. 
that seems to be the misconception because I've always heard that if both parties need to be online in order to use it. But this is what you're saying is that you can do something off like between two people and then only one of them actually needs to interact with the actual yeah. blockchain. It has to be interactive, but not synchronous. Exactly. So correct. And, uh, and so, yeah, as you say, uh, Frederick, uh, some of the privacy preserving uh, properties come from the fact that the transaction amounts are, are, are blinded. There's also no scripts. Uh, scripting or anything like that in uh, in these transactions. So each transaction look the same and are indistinguishable that way. Uh, and um, in a block, there's no list of, okay, these specific, these outputs uh, are spending to these outputs. So once they get aggregated, you don't really know which output is spending to which output. There are still some ways to link transactions. Ian Myers at, uh, from... Uh, the, the zero coin protocol from Zcash Foundation has a great talk uh, about uh, some of the linkability that you can achieve various, conducting various attacks um, on, on decoy based systems. So what you still have in green is that you have a, a link of some inputs spending to outputs that continue in a chain. And if you carry out some active uh, attacks on that, you might be able to link some outputs together. What, what I should say to that and what I should add to that as well, though, is that Grin has these privacy-preserving properties uh, turned on by default uh, for every user. It's not perfect by any, any means, but it, it achieves uh, kind of a, a decent level of obfuscation by default on the entire chain. Uh, and it does so at very little cost. I kind of look at it myself as, uh, as a kind of like a Goldilocks approach to a lot of things. Uh, simplicity, scalability, privacy-preserving abilities, and so on. Uh, fungibility. Uh, it's not necessarily just a privacy coin. Grin wants to, you know, we think a lot about electronic transactions in general. And in order to do electronic transactions in kind of cash-like behavior, uh, you need fung fungibility. Uh, that's kind of, that's why you need privacy in order, in order to achieve this fungibility so that you get cash-like behavior where the coins themselves don't necessarily have a memory. And it doesn't really matter who, who they belong to before, uh, before they arrived at you. I wondered about like how would how would it actually interact? I mean, you're talking about kind of transferring between two individuals, but like say you wanted to actually use this for some business purposes. Like is the on-ramp for Grin really complicated? Is it hard to get? I, I, I'm kind of curious like how this would work with exchanges and stuff like that. Like do the members have to buy on an exchange and then move it through these interactive things like to another place and then do this interaction? Or are there like tools that are being built to make that all easier? Uh, easier or more privacy preserving? Easier is actually the question. <laughs> uh, all right, cool. So, so, um, so with regards to the interactivity requirement, you know, on the, at a first glance, you might think that, oh, wow, this is so different from Bitcoin and, and uh, th th that, that complicates things a lot. But actually it turns out that it's quite well suited for online transaction flows in the sense that this dance between sender and receiver, it can be in reverse as well. So the receiver can start, send something to the sender that then responds back to the receiver that can finalize and broadcast it. So you could have an invoice flow, for example, where a merchant is presenting an invoice to the user, the user needs to set, sign it, return the response, and then the, the merchant just finalizes that and broadcasts it, right? which works very well for uh, online environments. Some exchanges now, I mean, right now we, we haven't had, uh, we don't have like a, a default uh, transaction building method that we're uh, recommending yet. It's something that we're working on. I have been working with some others on uh, Grimbox, which is an open transaction building protocol that gives you an address uh, that you can send and transact with uh, that doesn't go on chain. And uh, there are other uh, ways to do it. There are some uh, ideas being proposed right now, and the community is kind of evaluating different routes to take. I think what, what we'll look to be doing is try to find like a good enough kind of solution to use as a, like a recommended default without being too prescriptive about it, knowing that we don't want to say that there's only one way to achieve these things uh, and different users will have different needs uh, and, and use cases and some might need to be very private in the way they transact. Maybe they want to, you know, pass this file in a dark alley somewhere. Others might have less requirements on the privacy level, but just want something that's highly performant. Uh, we want to find some kind of good middle path there, like a Goldilocks approach to how to do that the best way. 
I like that term, the Goldilocks approach. Yeah, <laughs> uh, I, I like it too. Finding it was not too hot, not too cold, just right. Yeah, of. exactly, <laughs> exactly. Yeah, I mean, privacy is a deep rabbit hole to start getting into. And once you start talking about sending network messages, you can start talking about someone monitoring the entire network and you know the government monitoring uh, you know everything that leaves a country and they can still determine what comes from you or not and so exactly yeah, and, you and, can kind of talk about this endlessly but yeah and the, the chain is always you know it's not stronger than its weakest link there in that context and you yeah. know even though we have like there are some uh, approaches that take you know super advanced cryptography uh, and and use that to achieve something that's you know really great privacy in that context, but it comes at a high cost, and you know some of them have opt-in privacy, which uh, is kind of self-selecting and kind of marks you out as a user as well, which leads to its own problems. Um, and and in the end, you know a user even transacting in the most private protocols might still expose themselves by mistakes and user error. So, so it's, it's never like, it's a spectrum and it's never going to be perfect. And uh, we're painfully aware of that. I'm curious what, what the process to construct one of these transactions would be. And if we take Grinbox as an example, how is that built and how does the interactivity happen there? Right, so Green, Greenbox is an asynchronous uh, transaction relay. Uh, so each user has a relay that they're using and uh, they will they get an address derived from their private seed. Uh, it's like a, um, a, a public key, essentially, that is stored on the relay uh, that you, that other users can send a message to. Uh, and then the Greenbox user kind of pulls that message uh, and uh, processes it in its wallet and returns the response to the other user uh, who it originated from. Nice thing about that as well is that because these users, they have their address, which is a public key that they send with a private key to, you can have transaction proofs, which otherwise in a general, more general protocol like the, the file-based uh, exchange, you're not necessarily able to prove that somebody participated in the trans transaction. So it's almost kind of like building up a separate P2P network outside of the blockchain where people can send and receive over this this P2P network through relayers. Or yeah. would have, I suppose, its own sort of transaction pool where relayers store messages until someone comes along and uh, accepts the other end of it. Kind of like that, and, and I mean, it's it's very performant, it's very scalable. Uh, unfortunately, it puts some degree of trust on the on the relay itself, uh, at least the way it's done right now, because so the relay will send to another relay, uh, so you don't necessarily see who who you're in, who the user is interacting with, but it knows the addresses and can build up a transaction graph on that. We don't really like that. Uh, we wanna we wanna improve on that, so we have some ideas around it. We have some good ideas, we think, you know, something in kind of the mixed network direction. Uh, but each of these things kind of come with their own trade-offs as well. And um, I'm thinking a lot about how to propose a protocol method that, that, that is good enough to be rolled out like on a, on a green uh, wide level as, as like a, a solution that could work hopefully for, for most. So I, I just want to dig in a little bit more on the transaction itself because I, I still don't really grok how the transaction is created. You mentioned Schnorr signatures uh, and these transaction kernels. What are the kernels? And, and I assume they are the result of creating one of these transactions. So walk, walk me through what does person A sign? What does person B sign? And how does that end up in a kernel? So um, a long kind of step-by-step -step, uh, walkthrough um, in order to answer that question, I kind of need to walk through the, the Mimblewimble protocol in, in, in a bit more detail. So Grin relies partially on confidential transactions and, and that uses Peterson commitments. That, that's a way to, to blind the true amount of a value. So that's used in Grin and in confidential transactions to hide uh, the value of the output. In the original confidential transactions proposal, it was that the sum of the commitments used as inputs should equal the sum of the new commitments used as outputs, or that the difference should be zero to ensure that no amounts are being created uh, out of thin air when you create a transaction. So for example, if I have inputs uh, that are the value of two and two, uh, I can spend them to new outputs that are the value of three and, and one, uh, so that the inputs 2 and 2 equal uh, the outputs 3 and 1 
and, and them adding up so that both of them adds up to four means that there wasn't any new value created as part of the actual transaction. But, but there is a bit of a hack you can do here uh, where, where if you use uh, negative amounts, you can uh, create larger output values on, on the one side and it still kind of equates. In uh, that way, you could create money out of thin air. So, so in the previous example, so, so if I had uh, two inputs, uh, two and two, uh, spending two, out, two, two outputs, but instead of three and one, uh, they are instead one output is eight and the other one is minus four, uh, then you would have two plus two equals four on one side and then eight minus four on the output side. This would still equal each other, right? And it would still be four, four equals four, or, or you can uh, do um, four minus four equals zero. However, on the outputs here now, you now have an output that is eight, whereas you, you, you started with inputs that equated to four. So you've basically created a value of four out of thin air, and then you have that negative output of minus four, which you don't need to use. So in order to prevent against this, you want to make sure that inputs or outputs cannot take negative values. Uh, and in order to do so in green, we use bulletproofs, uh, which is an efficient zero-knowledge range proof that proves that uh, a particular output in question uh, is equal to or greater than zero. Uh, so each output has its own bulletproof, and an output is also a Peterson commitment, which is the, the true value plus a blinding factor that hides the value. Okay, so the kind of key insight from uh, the anonymous Tom Elvis Jetosaur was that it's not the entire Peterson commitment that need to be uh, summing to zero. Uh, as long as the actual values, so if you remember, a Peterson commitment is a, is a value and a blinding factor, as long as the values are, are summing to zero, we can ensure that we're not creating coins out of thin air, uh, as, as in the previous example I did. So the blinding factors of the Peterson commitments used in the, out, in, in the inputs and outputs do not need to add to zero, uh, and that is what ends up being called the public excess. And to prove that the values, the green amounts in, in the transactions are, are zero, that the, the inputs uh, and outputs that no new values are created as part of the transaction, um, we require a signature. It's only possible to create this signature on the excess if, in fact, the amount is zero. So it's like, it's a, it's a, it's a little bit too detailed uh, for, for me to explain now here, but uh, basically, in order to, to sign this excess value, the, the, the amount part of the Peterson commitment uh, needs to be zero. And conveniently, in order to create the signature, uh, you need to know the private keys of the outputs and inputs. So the signature, the signature to the excess serves two purposes. First of all, it proves that the green amounts uh, add to zero so that no money was created out of thin air. And it also proves that the participants in the transaction had knowledge of the private keys. So you can't really dispute that a transaction occurred uh, and that someone or some group at the point of the transaction had access to the private keys uh, for the outputs that were involved, which is good. And because we use uh, Schnorr signatures, uh, and these are linear, we can sum partial signatures together to create a full signature, which means that a transacting party uh, only creates a partial signature for their contribution to the excess value that they sign and ensure that the outputs are, uh, the values are zero. That can then be uh, summed together with the other transacting party to become a single signature for the full excess value. The Schnorr signature on the excess value, the transaction fee, and the lock height together form uh, the transaction kernel that is put on the chain. Aside from, from this transaction construction method, um, I know there's other uh, sort of privacy things in there. I read somewhere that you have this sort of random walk of how a transaction propagates through the network, so it seems that is not just regular gossip as it would be in Bitcoin. Yeah, we, we use uh, Dandelion and Dandelion++, plus plus, which was uh, pro proposed by Julia Fanti uh, and other researchers uh, to the Bitcoin network as well. Uh, so rather than just doing a gossip uh, protocol, uh, you each node um, has specific connections uh, through, uh, through specific epochs, and it, it sends a transaction only to one other node 
that then flips a coin uh, according to a probability, it will then continue sending it to a single other node. So you kind of form like a, a stem of, of this transaction traveling across the network in, to one node at a time until uh, it reaches a node that flips a coin and uh, the decision is to, to, to propagate the transaction uh, using gossip. So it, it looks kind of like a dandelion if you look at the flow of the transaction. This is, this is used to obfuscate the origin of the IP that broadcasted the transaction originally. Another, like as we talked about before, there are many different layers of you know, uh, being privacy preserving. And uh, if a global uh, passive adversary is monitoring the entire network and seeing where, um, uh, from which direction a, a transaction gets propagated, you can ascertain uh, you know, the originating node. Could this um, kind of message propagation protocol actually be used for other things? Is this something that is being experimented with in other protocols? Because it sounds quite interesting. Yeah, so it's it's quite recent. I think it's only been around, that, that paper has only been around for like a year or two. Uh, okay. I know Beam also uses Dandelion. Uh, they have their own modification to it, uh, but it would work for other protocols as well uh, to to make it harder to ascertain from which node a specific message originated from. If there's an adversary in the network, how do you prevent someone from just kind of sucking up all the messages and never propagating anything? If I'm just sending to one node, how do I know it actually passed that node? Yeah, so it's a good question. So there's like a fallback where each each node has like, um, just during the epoch, each, each node kind of keeps track of what they've forwarded along. And if they don't see a transaction propagated within a certain time, uh, you, you send it out yourself. But because there are some random delays uh, associated, you should have in the network, if you implement the protocol correctly, there should be random delays to when you send the transaction onwards. It doesn't necessarily need to be the originating node that does the fluff. It could be another node as well. Yeah. So if, if you are the originating node, you're really mindful about your privacy. You don't want to you know, show who you're and like, or that you're sending a transaction. You send it to one person. They don't seem to propagate it. You kind of wait until the next epoch, try again with someone else, that, that sort of structure. Yeah, or, or more like, uh, hey, I sent this transaction. I haven't seen it on the network. So, okay, so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to gossip it out now. Uh, but this, it, every node does this for any transaction they've seen. So that means that it's not necessarily the, the first node that's going to do it. So before we move on to talking about mining, which is something we want to cover a little bit, um, what proof of work do you have? Grin uses uh, the Cuckoo Cycle proof of work family, uh, created by John Trump, uh, who is uh, uh, also part of the Grin core team and is actively contributing to Grin for the past few years. The Cuckoo Cycle proof of work, um, on a high level, works like this: uh, you you have billions of uh, graphs connected, uh, and what you try to do is trim away uh, connections until you find a loop. In the cuckoo cycle proof of work, it's a 42 cycle. So essentially, a loop connecting 42 uh, nodes together. It's easier to do visually. There's like a great talk online uh, from John himself uh, that explains this in detail. Uh, if, you, if I send you the links, maybe you can put it in the show notes. Sure, we'll totally do that. So, so one of the reasons that we uh, chose this proof of work is that it's kind of very simple and it's only 42 lines of code. Uh, and... Um, uh, we have two variants of the proof of work active uh, since launch. So, you know, part of the ethos of Green is, um, is fairness. Uh, because we, we, you know, rely on donations and, and so on, we, we were thinking a lot about how to bootstrap a coin uh, in 2019 that had already a lot of attention on it. There were rumors about ASICs being developed by hidden entities and so on. Uh, and uh, we, we knew we had a lot of attention on us, so we wanted to figure out a way where we could bootstrap the proof-of-work network at the same time as encouraging ASIC development long-term, because we think ASICs are inevitable. We don't want to be ASIC-resistant or anything like that in the long-term. We also don't want to give you know, a single entity an unfair advantage from start. So uh, there were two variants of this Google Cycle proof-of-work. One was designed to be ASIC resistant, and it launched on getting 90% of the rewards of, of the network. Mm. And a second one, which was uh, designed to be ASIC friendly, uh, which got 10% of the rewards. Over time, uh, in the first two years of existence, 
this ratio is linearly increasing to the point where at the two-year anniversary of Grin, 100% of all mining rewards are going to go to the ASIC-tuned proof of work, which is simpler. And it's easier to build a, uh, an ASIC for. The idea was to essentially bootstrap the network with GPU miners uh, and over time push everybody onto the ASIC targeted proof of work. The fairness of that and how it worked and how it turned out, we, we originally hoped that you know, only high memory uh, GPUs would be able to mine the, the coin uh, to start off with. But as part of launching, there was some uh, significant improvements discovered that allowed low memory GPUs to, to mine it as well, which led to uh, GPU mining farms being able to mine the coin and making it harder for grassroots miners to, to mine efficiently and competitively. Uh, but these are like kind of the things that, you know, we're still still seeing uh, effects of that and efficiency improvements of it. Uh, it's, it's hard, uh, you know, I think somebody described they had a look at our, our launch and, and, you know, equal opportunity doesn't, doesn't mean equal outcome. Uh, certainly not in the case of mining grins successfully. Uh, but at least we didn't see, you know, an ASIC turned on from day one that nobody knew where it came from. Uh, so so there, there were, there, we, did, we did what we could to, to achieve as fair distribution of coins as possible. This actually leads us really nicely into sort of the next set of questions that we have about this. And that, that has to do with the making of the project and the launch. I went to actually, I think it was called GrinCon. Yeah, in Berlin. In Berlin. Yeah, I was there. And, and while I was there, I actually spoke to a few kind of investor type folks who were there. And they told me about these investments that they were making into the mining equipment for Grin. And that was very interesting because I guess other chains that have become very, very um, popular, they're not necessarily recognized from the start as being, the, you know, something to, to follow. They kind of grow in hype. In this case, the hype was there before it even launched. So I wonder, kind of going back to that time, did you feel like there was a lot of pressure on you guys or were you able to keep a clear head? Yeah, we, we, we did feel, uh, I mean, we had the world's eyes on us uh, for launch. And, the, you know, fortunately, the development team did an amazing job. I think that pulled off something uh, truly uh, phenomenal, small amount of people launching without a, the smallest hiccup even. But there was a lot of pressure and a lot of attention. I guess everything about this project has been done in the open. Uh, and some people in the Bitcoin community and others have been following it actively for a long time. And the buildup kind of just grew, right? And because there wasn't a way to, to get exposure to this coin uh, in any other way than mining it, there was a lot of investors and the people coming to the chats asking how to buy coins and they get, you know, get, get their allocation or whatever. And since we're not doing any of that, the only way to do it was to mine. So if you were an investor and wanted to have long-term exposure to Grin, you needed to mine the coin. And so that's how they set up these, uh, I heard like a lot of special purpose vehicles and so on being set up for it. You know, yeah. if it turned out successful or not for them and profitable or not, I, I really don't know. As we said, it was like a last minute surprise in terms of efficiency and competition there. Uh, but I hear that, you know, to some degree, this is still kind of ongoing where people are trying to get a hold of, of quantities of grain for like long term purposes. And because it's only proof of work mine and there's no uh, other distribution, you know, it's going to take a while for supply to, to be out. I should also add that we haven't talked about it. The emission rate of GRIN is, is one GRIN per second. Uh, 60 GRIN rewarded as a Coinbase reward in, in a one-minute block. So every second there's a new GRIN uh, minted, and this is uh, continuous indefinitely. Uh, there's no halvening, there's no changing the emission rate, which means that over time uh, the emission rate in percentage terms decreases to zero. Uh, but, but it's going to take a long time, and uh, there is a lot of emission going, be, being done um, in the first couple of years. Uh, and, and part of the reason, uh, the rationale for that was that they wanted, the, the, you know, the, the creators wanted something simple. There wasn't any, anything that said that, you know, the emission curve of uh, some other coins was, uh, was good or great or, you know, was the right one. So, you know, instead of presuming to think that they have the answer, they wanted something that's very easily understandable and, uh, and something that's fair. In the sense that, uh, you know, there, there's no rush, even if you find out about Green today and we launched in January, you know, there's time to, to get some Green if you want. You can, you can mm. wait till next year as well. It doesn't really matter. Uh, you know, early adopters are not really going to get rewarded uh, and latecomers are not going to get penalized. And that is part of the strategy of making this something that's usable. 
Uh, and because the team itself doesn't really have anything to gain from you as a listener or somebody else uh, getting a hold of Grim, uh, we can be quite honest uh, about how we set things up and, and also about the state of the protocol and how, how development is working. Interesting. You mentioned something a lot, which is this ethos of being fair. And I'm curious what fairness means. I mean, I think you, you've you already answered a question I had before, which is, why didn't you go proof of stake? Because you know, that seems to be the popular thing to do. But I suspect the answer goes back to this fairness point. But w w what does what does fair mean? It goes actually back to two things, uh, simple and fair. Proof of stake is not simple, at least not in 2019, and it certainly was not in 2016 when the project started. Uh, and uh, in terms of fairness, I think one of the unsolved problems with proof of stake is distribution. So the, I, I, I'm not familiar of any kind of fair way to distribute uh, the initial reward of proof of stake other than maybe through proof of work, which some of the projects are doing, and it's quite interesting, uh, I, I think, and I like to kind of follow that. But it's not simple. <laughs> and uh, and what, what we're trying to do here is, is to do as little as possible. This is, this is kind of amazing. Like, it sounds like this ethos is built through the entire thing, not only in the kind of architecting the the launch and architecting the rewards over time, but also in the way that the team is formed. And there's no company, there's no foundation, there's no profit motive as far as I can see. So as a fully decentralized project with you guys coming together very organically, did you actually have to sit down and say, like, these are our values? Or do you feel like the values just sort of came out because of the way this protocol was built. So it kind of organically grew. It started from, started from just a bunch of developers uh, doing an implementation and kind of it, it, the community grew as a result. Uh, one of the first things I did uh, as part of contribu contributing to the project was saying, hey, you know, should we, should we look at whether we need a foundation? Uh, and it did like a little kind of competitive analysis and review of other experiences from other coins and, and also trying to understand the use cases of a foundation. And the conclusion of that was that you know, the only possible maybe thing you would need a foundation for is to control maybe the, the trademark of the name or something like that or the logo. But we didn't really want that. And uh, we thought of it as like a centralizing force. And so, you know, why, why have it? There's no real use for it. Um, and maybe actually like one thing leads to the other, right? If we try to keep things simple and be minimal, and since we're also relying on donations, we, we don't have the funding to, to go out and do something crazy. So we have to be quite lean. Uh, and, and I think that's, that's very, very good for the project itself and its chances of success. We're actually being, we, we were being, as part of the big hype of the launch of, of, of the coin, we were also being mocked in some circles for, for being too naive. Uh, and, and the, you know, tragedy of the commons, rah, 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 you know, there's no way to, to be able to fund the uh, protocol development in a sustainable way, just relying on donations. But the fact of the matter is that we, you know, the project managed to launch uh, a fully working chain successfully with very little funding. Uh, there was some donations for one full-time developer at the time. Mm -hmm. uh, and now we're continuing. We have received, uh, thankfully, some uh, large donations from some contributors. Uh, but we're trying to do things as lean as possible. And the ethos of the community is always that we're not going to achieve real progress with paid developers. Uh, you know, that's not really going to work with us because we have no funding. We have no funding model. So mm -hmm. we have to kind of, it's, it's possible to be funded uh, from the project. There is some amount, there's some like some funds that you can be, uh, that, that can be used for, for supporting uh, people who contribute. But the, the kind of the lion's share of all contributions needs to be coming from an open source mm -hmm. developer uh, ecosystem. It, it just has to be because there's no other way, really. Let's talk about that funding then. So it started as a group and then you got some donation, which allowed you to pay for one full-time developer. And then you did a bid, you kind of did a call out for more donations. And, and so we're do, still doing these kind of fundraising efforts. We now have, uh, there was a big donation of 50 Bitcoin. It was a Coinbase reward, a, a big Bitcoin uh, Coinbase reward from 2000 and. 11 or something, I think, that was donated to the, to the, uh, from an anonymous source, uh, which has, you know, given us some sort of breathing room for funding, but we still feel that we don't have enough, of course. I think we're spending, you know, we look at it as something long-term, but I think that's kind of maybe the burn rate for other projects for a month. Um, but we always need more funding. We always need more developers. Uh, we need to grow the ecosystem. But, but it kind of, it's, it's quite interesting because, I mean, I can stress about these things personally, but... But Grin doesn't really care, uh, you know. Like Grin itself is an open source project, and you know maybe some people 
put some time into it uh, and get paid for it. Okay, that's great. At some point, maybe the money runs out. All right, what's going to happen then? Well, people need to con- contribute to the project in order for it to evolve. And, and it's going to be doing that whether or not there is funding for it uh, and whether or not people are able to sustain themselves on it. So it's it's kind of have its life of its own and it's uh, fascinating. It's my first open source project. Uh, you know, I used to work in companies and, and the and way you've, you've jumped into the most open source of all open source projects. Yeah, it sounds like <laughs> I, I like it. You know, I, I think it's an interesting model. I mean, I, on two notes, one on the sort of, um, the point of a foundation is to be able to distribute those funds, right. And be able to do that in a legal way taking donations and then distributing that as salary, I'm pretty sure is illegal in most places. I guess and that's so you, up to like individual people's tax position in based in the jurisdiction. Exactly, there, exactly. But. Yeah. So depends on which jurisdiction you're in. And having a foundation means that you can take those donations and then pay people regardless of which jurisdiction they're in. Uh, but that aside, on the open source note is there's this interesting movement recently in the rest of open source. So um, there was this NPM package maker, uh, open source developer who has one of the most popular NPM packages in, which is in the JavaScript world for those who aren't aware. He had an interesting experiment where he put an ad in the install description of his package. <laughs> So when you ran npm install, I it might be fuzzy on some of the details here, but I'm pretty sure it was when you ran npm install, it showed an ad and he would get paid for that. Um, and people were so fucking pissed. Like they really hated that this guy who makes free software and gives it to like hundreds of thousands of people would make money. They were so pissed at him. And it's just, it's weird. Like it, it's, there is this, sense that open source developers are not allowed to make money but at the same time to his point like he can't keep doing this he can't keep working on this stuff unless he makes money somehow he has to put food on the table as well so there is this balance you have to strike there is this uh tension between these two things in the case of what you just described though i think it might have also been like a cultural misfit like ads there's a certain connotation when ads are there. And I think the idea is if open source is similar to like independent, then that kind of sleazy mainstream activity shouldn't exist there. I think that might be part of the problem. Whereas I think, I guess donations fit better somehow, but I wonder- sure, are there... but they don't work. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> this guy like wrote a package that's used by millions of people, including Google, Facebook, all the big companies, People make billions of dollars off the back of his work, and he doesn't get a cent. Oh, I'm not saying that's good <laughs> by any means. Yeah. But I do wonder, like, given where Grin is at, like, you guys must have to think creatively about ways to fund your enterprise, and those must have to fit somehow within the ethos of the community. I mean, the, the way, I mean, I, I can only speak for myself, right? I can't speak for the project because the project doesn't have a voice. But the way I look at it as, as well is that it, it depends a little bit on what your end goal is. And, you know, even in the example of uh, NPM, so, you know, if the end goal is to make money for the developer or kind of sustain themselves, that's one thing. Uh, widespread adoption and success in terms of reach is a different thing. And uh, for Grin, I, I don't think that anybody that was attached to, t- to the project was looking, you know, for a way to make money uh, and, you know, in- to increase the chances of success for Grin, which are still pretty shaky, I would say. It's better for the project itself if it's run like this. A lot, a lot of things I was seeing in in, uh, in other communities in, in crypto when before I kind of found out about Grin was that you know it was kind of felt like you were discovering a, a project and then you kind of ah I came a little bit late because now the ICO has been done or the team has been formed and they've been given their kind of token allocations and uh, ah okay so now it's too late for me to kind of get involved because obviously if I contribute to this somebody else is getting richer uh, as the uh, token appreciates or something. Grin doesn't have that, you know, it's, uh, you know, anybody can just start contributing and it's, you know, nobody's better off as a result, aside from the community as a whole, of course, but it's very welcoming that way. And I think that design increases the chances of success. Hmm. But you do still, I mean, you, it's not like it's something that you just build one time and then put out into the world. Like I imagine you still have to add to it and work on it. So like, how do you do that continual development? 
Yeah, like in terms of with no funding, you mean? Yeah, I mean, this is this is the big question. But okay, so before we, because I, I want to hear your answer to this, but actually I wondered, is there any, there's no founder reward or anything like that? There's no block rewards, team community rewards or anything like that? So what, what we saw is that, uh, so, so just having this council and then the community and, the, you know, having donations coming into to multi-sigs controlled by the council, so on, doesn't really work as a, as a way to, to become less uh, centralized. Uh, so we looked at ways of, uh, you know, other open source communities, how they do their governance. Uh, we're 100% written in Rust and um, looked a bit at how Rust does their governance model, which was intriguing and seemed an uh, interesting uh, way to experiment for us as well. So we, we, we've initiated this process of trying to uh, create sub-teams uh, that are uh, running their own show. Uh, so we have a node development uh, sub-team and a wallet uh, development sub-team. And uh, we're looking, at, looking to set up a moderation sub-team and, and, and others, ecosystem uh, and so on. Uh, and, um, and have these kind of run autonomously and, and, and try to push out a lot of the responsibilities away from the core team so that ultimately the core team will do as little as possible uh, and, and let the other teams kind of self-form and, and, and do that. That's how we hope to be able to scale a bit better because we can't really have just eight people or something on top uh, being, being expected to do the most of the heavy lifting. Instead, we want to engage the wider community and these ultimately these sub-teams should you know, be able to request funding uh, and so on as well. Uh, we'll see how that works out. There's also an RFC process, which is similar maybe to a BIP or, or, or so on, but also uh, you know, traditional uh, request for comments process where anybody who wants to make a substantial change to the pro uh, project can propose that. Uh, and that gets then evaluated on its own process. I wonder in that in that model where you kind of break it off, would you what if one of those subgroups decided to find a way to monetize themselves? So like say the wallet group. I mean obviously they'd still have the same ethos of the of the community, but what if they what if they were like actually wallets like you can do you can run ads. You can put, you can put ads in it. <laughs> Like, would, would that, what would happen? So this is kind of a link to like the way you guys would govern yourselves. So say that group decides to do something that maybe the rest of the community doesn't like, how would that be dealt with? These are the challenges of governance systems in general. The short answer to that is that, you know, it depends on the situation, I guess, and the, and the circumstance, and it's not clear what the outcome would be, uh, but it never is. We look at governance as something incredibly complex. And I, myself, I studied a bit of political science in the back uh, a long time ago. And I, I, I don't remember much of it. But what I do remember was that there's no straight answer, right? And, and you know, don't, don't like thinking that you can design like this perfect uh, uh, technological solution to like a human problem. I'm, I'm not convinced that that's the right way to do, especially if you want to keep things simple. And um, Ultimately, we, we want to move away from like having like anything that's like done like through voting or majority voting. Uh, I'm sure as you've covered probably before, it's hard to do that in crypto environments uh, because of civil attacks, uh, you know, and doing it with coins doesn't necessarily solve the problem either. Uh, and in generally, just doing referendums is not necessarily the best way to achieve like a like a good outcome for a community uh, because it can end up being very divisive as we've seen in the real world. And, um, you know, that doesn't seem like to be the right way to, to reach agreement. Uh, so what we're trying to do is to encourage consensus building approaches where we try to reach a consensus, but still doesn't mean that everybody has a veto and can just block a process indefinitely. And, you know, we're not taking like a full democracy approach either. There was a, a founder, uh, the founder kind of has final say on a lot of things. And uh, there is now like a, a core team. You, you don't vote to, to get added to the core, core team because we don't know how to do that, you know, in a good way. Uh, so it's never going to be like fully democratic or anything like that. But I'm not, I'm not sure that's the, the right way to do it either. But it's just like a, it's messy types of trade-offs that you have to make all the time. And, uh, you know, in, in that specific example with the wallet uh, development team going rogue and like putting banner ads everywhere, I don't really know how we would handle that. Uh, you know, I'm sure like the the community would have an outcry, and then more people would join the wallet dev team and kind of change that maybe if there was enough support for it. But it's all fuzzy. I would be curious to hear just a summary of like where you've come from and where you are and where you see it going. Like, what is the path for you? Are you towards the end of the cycle? Are you right at the beginning of the journey? Uh, so we're we're very much. It feels like at the beginning, 
you know, it feels like it, it feels like it's it's been like three years since we launched, but it's been uh, nine months. Uh, but we have a long way to go. We, we managed to launch. You know, it's great. Uh, we, we came out there. Everything's working. Nothing is broken. That's great. But we have so much more we want to do. Uh, we're going to improve the user experience. Uh, to make it easy for people to actually transact uh, using Grin and start embedding it in their own use cases. Uh, we want to grow the ecosystem of developers and also other types of contributors to the project. We need like tons of technical writers, testers, marketeers, spreading the good gospel of Grin you know, to, to every corner of the world. Um, and um, we want to continue pushing ahead with bleeding edge, state-of-the-art uh, ideas to do things in a simpler way. Uh, aggregate more, keep less data on the chain, uh, do everything in a, like a, uh, you know take away as much uh, code as possible over time, and, and hopefully we'll get there. The, the, my my personal challenge is to make sure that I keep a long long enough term view. Uh, I, I tend to just you know think about too to short term in, in in the state of progress. Just wanted to move faster all the time, but but you know it's 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 a multi year project. It's going to take a long time to to mature. Sounds like there's like you need you need. You need and have probably very passionate people. It's quite self-selecting in a way, right? Because what, we, what yeah. we discovered was that, you know, hey, if there's not like a system where anybody can get rich quick, those people don't tend up sh- to show up. And instead you have these, these crazy people <laughs> that, are, <laughs> that are like uh, very, very like passionate and, and uh, do it uh, because they believe in some things. All right. Well, listen, thank you so much for coming on the podcast and talking to us about Mimblewimble and Grin. And your experience launching an exciting privacy-oriented blockchain. Thank you so much for having me. Uh, it's, it's been really fun. Thank for you sure. very much. And to our listeners, thanks for listening. Thanks for listening. Thanks for listening.